Just a disclaimer, we discuss some Christmas truths that may not be suitable for children. One other note, I would suggest listening to our episode called Toy Riots as a companion to this one. On this season, we'll be exploring our bizarre beliefs, unfounded fears, and fantastical thinking, how they shape our psychology and culture, and how much of our past we can find in the present. I'm your host, Chelsea Weber-Smith, and this is American Hysteria. We're not surrendering, ladies and gentlemen. Merry Christmas to these devil worshippers and leftists! And these godless bullies will not stop until they've eradicated Christianity. How do you just revise it, you know, in the middle of the legacy and change Santa from white to black? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't. I've got some bad news, folks. Christmas is going to be cancelled. During my elementary school years, I remember tearing away the patterned wrapping paper on Christmas morning to uncover, at one time, a Super Nintendo, and a few years later, an N64. All Christmas night, I played Donkey Kong or I played GoldenEye, either bouncing the bad guys to death or shooting them with a sniper rifle. I knew I was the good guy because the game told me I was. I was the beefy gorilla with a heart of gold, or the slick James Bond, who despite his more unsavory attributes, was the hero of the story. Good and bad were always on my mind back then, as I woke up with anxiety stomach aches because I so wanted to be good. I wanted it really more than any of the gifts I received. The Razor scooter that would go on to bash my ankles in, the robot dog that tipped over at the slightest bump, the eerie Furby that turned on in the middle of the night, the glorious shine of a holographic Pokemon card. But on Christmas, I knew I was a good guy because the morning told me so. A bounty from Santa was the evidence, right? But when I got older, I found out that the Santa barometer of goodness was not as valid as I once thought. I learned that many of my friends didn't have the same middle-class privilege that I did, and they were not the recipients of such trendy gifts. But I knew they weren't bad, and many of them seemed to be much better than me. So they came over to my house instead and hung out in my room while we killed each other with timed grenades, both of us believing for a simple moment that we were the good guy for sure. On this American Hysteria Christmas special, we'll take a long, hard look at the difficult history of our most cherished American holiday, how it evolved, and how it harmed and manipulated the vulnerable while keeping the privileged feeling good. Contrary to what you might imagine, the original war on Christmas was not waged by the swampy liberal agenda, but in fact was waged by the most religious of the nation, the Puritans, in order to curtail the rowdy indulgence that marked late December. We'll see in the antebellum South how Santa Claus started to look a lot more like a slave owner than a benevolent saint, and a kind of mock generosity began to mark the season. As the Civil War approached and then ended in a Union victory, this performance of generosity began to focus on the poor and the homeless, who the rich gathered by the thousands to watch consume lavish Christmas dinners with the kind of pitiful gratitude that the upper class demanded. Then we'll see how this apparently liberal-led conspiracy called the War on Christmas has colored the holiday season since Hitler's favorite guy, Henry Ford, first accused the Jewish Illuminati of conspiring to destroy Christmas and then, of course, overthrow America. Instead of the gentler version of Judgment Day that our favorite American holiday has become, the war on Christmas crowd wants the real Judgment Day back, with kids no longer volleying for Santa's good list, but instead St. Peter's at the pearly gates. Now, I know you might be mad at me for coming after this beloved holiday that brings family and friends together, that gives us a reason to show the love we often forget to show each other with whatever we're able. 
don't worry, I'm not here to hashtag cancel Christmas like the dramatic blizzard of snow once threatened to do in the popular Christmas classic, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. It's why I released this episode on December 26th. So don't you cry and don't you pout, because regardless of what Christmas has meant, regardless of what Christmas means, you better watch out. Because today, the real Santa Claus is finally coming to town. Christmas, or the winter solstice season in its various forms, has always been about an indulgence in excess. These days we know the holidays as a time of ruckus capitalism, with even fistfights over the hottest gifts of the season that we covered in our episode called Toy Riots. But before the Industrial Revolution, wintertime simply meant that the hard agricultural work was done. The harvest was acquired and the feeling of abundance invigorated communities and led to a large consumption of food and, of course, a whole lot of drinking. You might be surprised to learn, as I was, that America's most influential and conservative ancestors, the Puritans, actually hated Christmas. In fact, the original war on Christmas was waged against the pagan-esque parties that marked this holiday in early American history. In 1659, Boston actually made Christmas illegal, doling out 50 shilling fines for any citizens caught celebrating, even privately in their homes. This is because, at the time, the weeks around Christmas were like a city winning the Super Bowl on the 4th of July. Basically, white men and boys took to the streets in hordes, sloppy with drunken fervor, blowing loud horns, shooting off guns and fireworks into the cold white sky. They called it going Christmasing, with one Southerner in 1868 describing the festivities like this. It was the custom, and still is in the more isolated communities, for a crowd of young men to band together and with guns and every sort of instrument of music or of noise go Christmasing among their neighbors. These men and boys would then go on a fox hunt, which usually didn't pan out into an actual kill. It was mostly just an excuse for more drunken noisemaking. Then they would find a house where a big feast was prepared by the women who were, of course, made to stay inside for the whole event. However, they were allowed during Christmas time to begin drinking first thing in the morning, and that they did. Each night, these women would leave the sleepy men and boys alone so that they could have a slumber party all together. For two weeks, this would repeat each evening. A rowdy parade, a drunken fox hunt, an elaborate feast at a different house, and then a big sleepover. They went house to house, never returning to their own. And by the end of the celebration, participants could find themselves some 20 miles from their homes. Adorable. Before the Civil War, as you might imagine, we find a very different Christmas happening in the slaveholding South, where some of the earliest traces of the good and the bad lists we now consider Santa's jurisdiction began. Surprisingly, though, slave owners on antebellum plantations granted enslaved people up to five weeks of almost total freedom— freedom to visit friends and family that they had been separated from, and to have gatherings of their own that usually involved dancing and singing and, of course, drinking. They also received gifts, usually by approaching the big house, almost as if they were visiting a Santa Claus at a modern American mall. Facing this throne of the white family, they would receive gifts like candy and fruit, and sometimes they would throw out coins to the children. Often, the slaves were given jugs of whiskey to pass around, with their kids receiving a watered-down version. Slave owners could even go as far as to act like enslaved people themselves, with white women cooking and white men serving them dinner. But these elaborate scenes I've described were not that common. 
More common were slave owners giving gifts that the enslaved people needed throughout the year. Corn, winter clothing, coal for burning, the necessities of life masquerading as generosity. Confirmed by diary entries and letters from the time, sociologists have discovered that these traditions were not kind-hearted gestures, but instead served as a way to quickly finish up the harvest and encourage good behavior all year. But see, the Christmas gifts and the freedoms were not guaranteed, with slaveholders often taxing their Christmas bonuses for misbehavior. They promised rewards as long as these enslaved people made it on the good list. And there was another reason why. Abolitionist and former slave Frederick Douglass wrote that, quote, From what I know of the effect of these holidays upon the slave, I believe them to be among the most effective means in the hands of the slaveholder in keeping down the spirit of insurrection. This was not just a theory that Frederick Douglass came up with. The real reasons for Christmas were common knowledge among slaveholders and the white people they employed as overseers, with one man writing in a private correspondence, quote, I killed 28 heads of beef for the people's Christmas dinner. I can do more with them this way than if all the hides of cattle were made into lashes. Predictably, the general public didn't know about these more sinister reasons. A public that loved this story of generosity and mercy, of pity. Though most white Americans did not own slaves, they still benefited greatly from their labor, and they were so happy to hear about the joy that marked these plantations, the propaganda campaign of the happy slave. They needed the enslaved to appreciate their Christmas, to revel in a joy they hardly witnessed. Because, of course, black folks on the plantation were excited, were experiencing outward joy, were showing their gratitude. This is how it worked. Despite the rest of the year, slave owners in that time could believe that they themselves were good, and that feeling could last all year. In 1824, Dr. James Norcom stood in front of the North Carolina state legislator and spoke these words, quote, At such a season, instead of driving these wretched creatures with cold and unfeeling sensibility from our doors, the heart of charity dilates toward them, and the angel of humanity whispers in our ears that they are entitled to a part of those blessings which their labor has procured us. Years later, his own slave, Harriet Jacobs, would detail in her autobiography that she spent a Christmas day hiding in a dark crawl space from this very man a man who was trying to force her into his own sexual slavery. After the Civil War changed the landscape of race and class, the Industrial Revolution began making the wealthy wealthier, and their own spoiled children grew bored of the gifts they got and often went full, sweet 16, throwing tantrums if a rocking horse's mane was the wrong color or if a train was too small. This jadedness irked their parents as it irks parents today, and they were hungry for that hearty gratitude, and so they took action. By the late 1800s, the middle and upper classes poured into auditoriums and stadiums to watch a group of over 1,800 poor newsboys, who they called street urchins, eat a lavish Christmas dinner live. These newsboys were screened and then handpicked by these charitable organizations to provide maximum graciousness and minimal hijinks. These shows sometimes went on tour, feeding both poor children and adults, and that's when the Salvation Army popped on the scene. Their self-indulgent slogan, which today reads, quote, doing the most good, feels appropriate to this time period, considering that the stadiums they rented would draw crowds all dressed in their finery, dripping with diamonds, donning top hats and canes. All in all, they would watch 20,000 of the city's most vulnerable residents eat with excitement. The New York Times published a piece in capital letters, The Rich Saw Them Feast, with another witness stating that the rich, quote, looked on in happy sympathy. 
More after this. And now, back to the show. Again, these were the necessities of life masquerading as generosity. And of course, the food ran out before all these entertainers were fed. How were these elaborate productions funded? Well, of course, by homeless folks disguised as Santas, ringing their bells, asking for donations on street corners, just as we see today. Speaking of Santa, at the same time that these deceptively generous rich people were sitting on their Christmas thrones, giving the gifts of necessity to the enslaved and eventually food to the poor, the character we now call Santa Claus was forming through borrowed folklore and influential stories, as well as more of that special duality of good and bad, the idea of reward and punishment for the previous year. In order to dive into the development of Santa Claus, let's take a look at the original dark turn of Santa's fight against the naughty with an anonymous 1823 poem called Old Santa Claus with Much Delight, which included the first images of a reindeer-powered sleigh and Santa's trips down the chimney. Here are a few of the most formative words of Old Saint Nick. Wherever I found good girls or boys, that hated quarrels, strife, and noise, I left an apple, or a tart, or wooden gun, or painted cart. But where I found the children naughty, in manners rude, in temper haughty, I left a long black birchen rod, such as the dread command of God directs a parent's hand to use when virtue's path his sons refuse. You heard it right. Children who misbehaved were threatened with rods left by Santa Claus, and their parents were encouraged to beat them into future goodness. This anonymous author and illustrator was the first to adapt the various European legends of a 4th century bishop named Saint Nicholas, a character not unlike Jesus Christ who preceded him. Born in a small Roman town around the year 280 AD, St. Nick was a chronic giver, distributing his large inheritance to the poor and sick as he traveled on foot through the region. He was also a hardcore Christian in a time of Roman-led persecution of Jesus' followers. Spending years of his life in prison for refusing to renounce his faith, he was finally freed when Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. Once free, St. Nicholas was known for two major acts of generosity and miracle. He once paid a dowry for three young girls so that they could find husbands in order to keep them from a forced sex work. Another tale says that he also entered an inn to stay for the night and then felt a kind of psychic tingle. He focused on the words of God that told him that the innkeeper had murdered three boys and pickled them in the basement. Not only did St. Nick magically know about the crime, but he actually resurrected the pickled boys and thus became known as the patron saint of children. Before the 19th century, St. Nicholas had always been depicted as a bishop, complete in authoritative bishop robes and holding a religious staff. Continuing Santa's transformation, an 1837 poem called A Visit from St. Nicholas that we now know as Twas the Night Before Christmas helped change his image from religious authority to kindly elf. But author Clement Clark Moore was also a slave owner and a devout anti-abolitionist. But the man who created the first modern images of Santa, however, fell on the other side. Thomas Nast, the father of the political cartoon, was a strong Union supporter and abolitionist, and his Santa had a clear allegiance with the North. In the most outright version, one of Nast's cartoons showed a secular Santa Claus, decked out with Union clothes and carrying a puppet with a rope around its neck that looked suspiciously like Confederate President Jefferson Davis. And with these works, Santa was becoming something else entirely, a being separated from the Christian faith. Santa was becoming political. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. 
As the century reached its end, a wave of scientific discoveries like the light bulb and the telephone began to shake the foundations of a devoutly Christian nation. They could see that the magic of technology was anything but. And after people began moving into cities in huge numbers, they met people very different from them, and they began to explore possibilities outside of their strict Christian morality. But the older generation was resolute in their commitment to the unseen, and they began to need children to just believe in something. Just like today, kids had questions. In a famous letter to the editor of the New York Sun, this desire to believe was made clear. An apparent little girl named Virginia had written a letter that was answered by veteran journalist Francis Church in what would become the most reprinted newspaper article of all time. It went like this. Dear editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there's no Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? And here is Francis's response. Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared with the boundless world around him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole truth and knowledge. You may tear apart the baby's rattle and see what makes the noise inside, but there is a veil covering the unseen world, which not the strongest man, nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived, could tear apart. Only faith, fancy, poetry, love, romance can push aside that curtain and view and picture the supernatural beauty and glory beyond. What a totally graspable and appropriately metaphysical speech for an eight-year-old girl. Santa Claus was just kid-friendly Jesus, Jesus Light. He was the Jesus of the Industrial Revolution, grown plump as an aristocrat and covered in expensive furs, doling out presents to the rich and poor alike with a promise of future prosperity of an equality that never was and never really would be. This easy, secular Santa continued to rise in popularity, and by the 1930s, he was everywhere. He was the feature of the Ladies' Home Journal. He was the popular icon of Coca-Cola's Christmas ad campaign. In addition to his rise into the lord of capitalism, Santa was becoming a symbol of the power of children's innocence and imagination that was sweeping the culture after even the poorest children got their labor rights, no longer forced to work in the factories of the Industrial Revolution, something we cover in detail in our Satanic Panic series. The family unit was influenced by the artistic movement of romanticism, and children, especially those of the rich, became precious and almost doll-like, in need of careful sheltering, and in need of a new, more huggable religious figure. And of course, a sweeter Judgment Day. But this secular Santa really rattled more Orthodox Christians, who accused him of trying to replace Jesus Christ. They didn't like a mild judgment day. They didn't like a mild judge. They wanted kids focused not on the presence of Christmas, but instead the rewards at the end of their life. That is, if they were good enough to get into heaven. And more importantly, to avoid an eternal hell. And of course, just like always, the more conspiracy-oriented Christians, you know, those with a little bit of martyrdom racing in their blood, went a little further. Who was responsible for getting rid of Jesus? Who was responsible for oppressing the Christian faith? Where did it all lead? Well, back to the Illuminati, of course. 
The famous War on Christmas, as we know it today, is, of course, the notion of a concerted effort from liberals to secularize and destroy the Christian part of Christmas with what else but their rabid political correctness campaign and this nasty little thing called being inclusive. The roots of this conspiracy theory date back to the 1920s, when American tycoon Henry Ford printed widespread articles that accused Jewish people of trying to destroy Christmas for good. As we covered in the Illuminati episode in season one, Ford was the main man behind the popularization of the international Jewish conspiracy, one that claimed that this shadow group, sometimes known as the Illuminati, was trying to take over the United States. In terms of Christmas, Ford asserted in 1921 that, quote, By last Christmas, most people had a hard time finding Christmas cards that indicated in any way that Christmas commemorated someone's birth. Thirty years later, the famous far-right hate group, the John Birch Society, who loved Henry Ford's writings, blamed the hottest scapegoats of the season, you know, the communists. They also blamed the United Nations, who Illuminati conspiracy theorists to this day believe are trying to make the earth a godless heathen paradise for the very rich after a genocide of all good white patriots. In their pamphlet called There Goes Christmas? Question mark, exclamation mark, they called the UN fanatics who aimed to, quote, poison the 1959 Christmas season with their high pressure propaganda. The conservative outrage around this new holiday political correctness really got cooking in the 1990s as televangelists and conservative media resurrected and adapted the Illuminati theory for the modern era, led by American hysteria darling, troll televangelist himself, Pat Robertson. But this Yuletide anger was also coming from another writer and magazine editor named Peter Brimelow, who contributed to a far-right website sympathetic to white nationalists called vdare.com. He coined the term the War on Christmas, stating that this conspiracy was, quote, part of the struggle to abolish America. He ran a column that exposed companies and government offices that were bending to the liberal agenda. Evildoers included the Department of Housing and Urban Development, who disgustingly threw an employee party called, and how dare they, a celebration of holiday traditions. And then Amazon, with no regard for human life, wished their customers happy holidays on their homepage instead of Merry Christmas. Merry, happy holidays. You can say Merry Christmas. Actually, no, I can't. You can bring light and joy to a culture that wants to remove Christ from the season. Watch for this mailing and display your Merry Christmas window cling in your home or car as a witness to keep Christ in Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. (laughs) Yes, it is. Suddenly, American parades began nixing the religious floats. There were a handful of lawsuits that saw Christmas symbols extinguished on government property, nativity scenes taken from public schools as activists cited the separation of church and state. But conservative activists did not see it that way, with televangelist Pat Buchanan saying, quote, What we are witnessing here are hate crimes against Christianity. Fox News and their now doxxed host, yet another American hysteria darling, Bill O'Reilly, had a regular segment called Christmas Under Siege. And he helped organize boycotts of popular department stores like Sears, Target, and Walmart. And almost all responded to the pressure by reinstating Merry Christmas in 2006, leading tomato-faced chronic victim Bill O'Reilly to declare a temporary victory. Around this same time, an angry woman sent Walmart an email about their use of happy holidays and received this amazing response from a customer service employee. Quote, Santa is also borrowed from the Caucasus, mistletoe from the Celts, Yule log from the Goths, the time from the Visigoth, and the tree from the worship of Baal. It's a wide, wide world. 
Right away, the Catholic League of Religious and Civil Rights took this as an assault and led yet another boycott, with Walmart immediately firing the fun and daring employee. And then the famous Starbucks cup controversy exploded in 2015, the first year that the chain toned down the Christmas theme to be more inclusive with a simple red cup. Today I read, and I have Starbucks, they're my tenants. Did you read about Starbucks? No more Merry Christmas on Starbucks, no more. I have one of the most successful Starbucks in Trump Tower. Maybe we should boycott Starbucks, I don't know. Seriously, I don't care. But if I become president, we're all gonna be saying Merry Christmas again, that I can tell you, that I can tell you. Because Starbucks has become a kind of corporate symbol of mainstream liberal culture, it was a perfect scapegoat to create this apparent Christian oppression that looked more like a simple equality to the rest of us. And then, and then, the very next year, one unsuspecting researcher dared look into the history of a song called Jingle Bells and unwittingly became the new secret agent in the war on Christmas. She had quietly published a peer-reviewed paper called The Story I Must Tell, Jingle Bells in the Minstrel Repertoire. Kina Hamill was interested in figuring out the true origin of the most popular Christmas carol of all time, but she found something different than she expected which I totally relate to. That's right, Jingle Bells was first sung by a white man in blackface at an 1857 Boston minstrel show. Written by a man who also wrote pro-Confederate anthems, James Piermont, Jingle Bells was just one of the many songs he wrote to make money, quote, satirizing black participation in Northern winter activities. Soon, right-wing trolls and then right-wing media went absolutely nuts as they read about her assertions. A Fox News host bleated, Newest Christmas controversy has social justice warriors claiming this classic holiday carol is racist. Now famous right-wing media group Breitbart said that Kina was trying to force America to, quote, shun the jaunty tune. In just days, her name became a trending hashtag on Twitter. Cruel and threatening emails poured in, trolls harassed her on Facebook, even calling her at her house. It was confusing because, in reality, Kina hadn't suggested any sort of boycott of Jingle Bells, and she hadn't made any statements about the tune being racist in and of itself, and she certainly didn't say that it should be canceled for good. She just told the truth of what she found, and that was enough to send people into hysterics, claiming, of course, that they could never be racist and that it was racist to even suggest that they were racist, as if Kina had ever suggested that in the first place. She was just a simple academic publishing her results. Let's look to another Christmas controversy from 2013 when writer Aisha Harris for Slate wrote an article called Santa Claus Should Not Be a White Man Anymore. The article just adorably suggests that perhaps it's time to turn Santa into something like a penguin so that kids of color don't have to feel left out. Her writing describes her experience of having images of a black Santa Claus at home while everywhere else only seeing a white one. Quote, eventually I asked my father what Santa really looked like. Was he brown like us or was he really a white guy? My father replied that Santa was every color. Whatever house he visited, jolly old Saint Nicholas magically turned into the likeness of whatever family lived there. Well... Let's see what Megyn Kelly of Fox News had to say about that. And when I saw this headline, I kind of laughed and I said, oh, this is so ridiculous. Yet another person claiming it's racist to have a white Santa, you know. And by the way, for all you kids watching at home, Santa just is white. But this person is just arguing that that maybe we should we should also have a black Santa. But, you know, Santa is what he is. And just so you know, we're just debating this because someone wrote about it, kids. Just because it makes you feel uncomfortable doesn't mean it has to change. You know, I mean, Jesus was a white man, too. But, you, you know, it's like. We have, he was a historical figure. I mean, that's a verifiable fact, as is Santa. I just want the kids watching to know that. Well, okay. 
And then when the first report went online about Mall of America's decision to employ their very first black Santa, the very first black Santa in America, the Minneapolis Star Tribune had to close their comment section almost immediately after horrific racist comments and complaints about reverse racism began to saturate the article. Peter Morgan of CBS Minnesota went as far as calling for a boycott, writing, quote, Stupid, incredibly stupid. Santa is white. Boycott Mall of America. Maybe they should change their name to Mall of Raghead Land. Ugh. Of course, uh, it's an interesting irony considering the real birthplace of Jesus in the Middle East. But that Jesus does not match the American status quo or American politics. Of course, San is a white man. Of course, Jesus is a white man. Of course, God himself is a white man. It's laughable, and apparently it's offensive to consider it any other way. Even if history tells a different story of a poor infant born in a manger in modern-day Palestine. This war on Christmas stuff is the same baseless victimhood narrative that we've talked about time and time again on American Hysteria with right-wing conspiracy theories. The Jewish Illuminati, the gay agenda, false flags, gun legislation, conspiracy theories at their heart do this tricky thing that make those espousing them, the ones often unwilling to acknowledge equal rights of others, into the oppressed victims of the story and often the heroes. It seems that to question Christmas supremacy, to question Christian supremacy, uh, to question white supremacy is a kind of assault, as we just heard with darling Megyn Kelly. By trying to do away with the greeting of happy holidays, we can trace this all the way back to Henry Ford and his Jewish conspiracies that we cover in the Illuminati episode. And now, in the middle of our new cultural attention to the real victims American society has produced and still does, it seems that these conspiracy theorists, too, need supremacy over that to be in the highest position at the top of victimhood. Today we see it in the wildly rich televangelists and politicians in the media who barely even bother to perform Christmas empathy anymore, telling this story instead of a war against them and other tales of imagined oppression, as if being outraged, as if being a victim, can now take the place of giving. Jesus was a victim too, martyred on a cross, but that's only part of the story. America has long told us who is good and who is bad, and it's very often not about behavior. The reality of blessings and presents is that the richer the family, the richer the kid, the easier it is to get through the velvet rope of the good list. I wonder if for many of the mega-rich and the mega-righteous, there isn't even a question of their own goodness. There's just an assumption. The slave owners of the antebellum South certainly weren't worried about how they treated the enslaved 11 months out of the year because during Christmas time, they visited those they referred to as wretched, gave them socks and corn to survive, felt the generosity they needed to to keep telling themselves the story of their goodness. So too did the wealthiest of the 19th and 20th centuries, watching those poor boys smile over a Christmas dinner as they watched with sympathetic eyes. More after this. And now, back to the show. As he grew up, Jesus found himself overcome with love for the most marginalized, for the least privileged, and he fought like a true badass to prevent the religious rich, the hypocrites, from lounging in their comfortable illusions of goodness. So yeah, let's talk about Jesus. Through Jesus and Santa as well, we have a story that we tell ourselves, a story of generosity, of a roaming giver handing out necessities and blessings, a promise of future abundance, either in this life or the next, as long as you follow the rules. But unlike Jesus, the modern Santa has never been a role model. He just exists as this faraway judge to corral kids into the categories of good and bad and to bestow the rewards or punishments they deserve. 
you could say the same thing about this modern Jesus that America has created, too. The Jesus of televangelists and the right-wing news. The Jesus of politicians who are suddenly saved, suddenly at the top of the good list for no good reason at all. No, I have great relationship with God. I like to be good. I don't like to have to ask for forgiveness, and I am good. I don't do a lot of things that are bad. I try and do nothing that's bad. We no longer seek to follow the example he set. You know, caring for the most in need without being weird about it. But instead, he acts as a surrogate judge so we can praise and chastise whoever we want in the false name of goodness itself. To challenge the narrative of Christmas is to challenge America itself and the stories it tells itself, the stories it just believes, what we beg American children to do. It's always been this way. The Puritans left Europe because they were too good, too righteous for England. And then the indigenous people they encountered were evil, bad, and the light of the Puritans' goodness won out. When white Americans kidnapped African men, women, and children and forced them into slavery, they did it because they thought they were holier, purer, the real humans, the good ones. Plantations spread the story of happy workers building the dreams of Americans like elves in a snow-covered palace. And then those who grew rich from the Industrial Revolution, from the sweat of the working class, told themselves stories of their goodness too, reaffirmed by an emerging pity for the lowly poor, for the well-behaved and grateful tiny Tims balancing on their crutches, with these reformed Scrooges handing out tokens of goodwill that barely scratched the surface of their unimaginable wealth. The cartoon of Scrooge McDuck diving flawlessly into his pool of gold coins. Today, Santa's become more of a CEO than a saint, and the elves he employs certainly do not live at the North Pole in a bright merry palace, but instead in Chinese factories where American toy companies outsource their labor, paying very low wages and requiring long hours in poor conditions while poisoning the local environment. This makes me feel terribly guilty, and I can barely think about it. I don't want to think about it. Do you? Here is another hard truth we cover with a story of happiness, a story of joyous elves. But knowing these truths doesn't always help, and not living up to a gold standard of activism, of material rejection, doesn't mean you're bad. For the working classes, American wages are far too low as well, completely out of step with inflation. In a cycle that perpetuates itself, products that are purchased as Christmas gifts need to be affordable. With massive U.S. companies continuing to move their factories overseas, we're losing precious jobs. Corporations claim they can't afford to pay for American labor because, here's some more patented victimhood, citizens aren't willing to pay a higher cost for their goods. And yet, we still hear whispers of the outrageous bonuses taken by the already mega-rich CEOs, the donations from viewers licked up by televangelists, these faceless scrooges that continue to ignore the ghosts of guilt clanging their chains. I like to think that they'll come for them one day. As bah humbug as this episode has been, again, I am not here to cancel Christmas, so please don't call my house or threaten to kill me. Thanks. The wonder of Christmas is wonderful, and Christmas makes sense on an instinctual level. It's a celebration of hope that the spring will return, that the darkness will become light again, that the abundance and indulgence we experience during Christmas time might extend into the rest of the year. And there are holidays like this all over the world in all time periods. In addition, there's an intrinsic human ritual studied by cultural anthropologists, one they call reciprocity, a tradition of gift giving vital to strengthening the bonds of the community. Though we all like to tell ourselves a selfless story during the Christmas season, experts say that our very DNA expects something in return. 
I don't see this need for reciprocity as inherently selfish or bad. It's all about bonding with our family and friends. On our best days, it's this desire to bond that worries us into shopping, the tradition America has made for us so that we can tell each other the feelings we can't figure out how to say. On our best days, we want to be good enough to be loved and be good enough at loving in return. On our worst days, it's a performance. We all like to be seen as good. We like to be seen as righteous. How can we help it? Jesus said, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Just the same, Santa Claus is known to request that kids be good for goodness sake. Sometimes though, we need proof to help us sleep at night, to just believe that we're one of the good guys. Like kids playing video games on Christmas night, we need the game to tell us that we are. I watch the kids that I tutor fight over toys, throw pencils at each other, call each other names. But I see too, these same children helping their little brothers navigate the dangers of the playground, hugging me goodbye when no one's looking, drawing pictures for new students without prompting that say, you don't have to be shy or afraid when you are here. Sometimes kids will perform their goodness just like you and me, and they want stickers and suckers in return. But other times it's different. Other times they don't care about being recognized. It's just something they genuinely wanted to do without the pressure of a Christmas holiday and the only reward being that feeling that we all get in our chests when we can help someone feel better. What if instead of the good and bad list, we put everyone who's really trying to do better on a new list called trying, trying to be good, trying to do right, whatever that means. I find relief from my moral fears that still give me stomach aches sometimes at night when I see myself as neither good nor bad, just a person trying and then trying again. Isn't that the point with this whole religion thing too? that we never reach complete goodness and we are never so bad as to be unforgivable? I know that after our class, these kids go home and play their new generation of video games, especially Fortnite, Save the World, where they are the heroes, the heroes who get to do just that, save the world without question. That's just what the game tells them to do. What if our deadly serious game, this game of capitalism, this game of culture, this game of giving and believing, this game of Christmas, told us to do just that, but maybe without all the guns? What if we truly put the Jesus back into Christmas, not as a scared straight replacement for Santa, but as a person humbled by love, who tells us to try and try again, to do better, to give? I'm not calling for the cancellation of Christmas. I'm not calling for a blizzard of tweets, but I am calling for that light to lead our sleigh through the storm. We don't have to cancel Christmas for its problematic past and its problematic present. We just have to see it. We just have to stop relying on the stories we tell ourselves of goodness and badness. Every single day, not only in the month of December, we just have to try. And then we just have to try again. From our own damn selves, this was American Hysteria's War on Christmas special. Next time on the show, season three will continue February 17th. And it's shaping up to be more hysterical than ever. For this post-Christmas episode, I'm throwing you a challenge for the rest of the year. If you have the means, find yourself an organization that speaks to you, something that you just believe in. Set up a monthly donation, and I'll do it too. By the way, this is my pageant of giving. And see how simple giving can enrich your life and the lives of others. American Hysteria just has one more special message for Bobby Harrington. To mom from Hunter. 
Merry Christmas. You're the greatest mom that I could have ever had. Thanks to you, I have a healthy amount of skepticism, but can still believe in the fun stuff like ghosts and ghouls. Thanks to you, I've got a sensitive side. Just right to balance out the rowdiness I get from dad. I love you and want the best for you as you do for me. Have a happy new year. Hunter Bunter loves you. American Hysteria is written, produced, and hosted by me, Chelsea Weber Smith. Produced and edited by Clear Como Studios. Voice acting by Will Rogers. Research assisted by Riley Smith with help from Miranda Zickler. This episode was recorded in Seattle at Densmore Studios. And not to be selfish, but we are an independent show now, so any donations you can make to American Hysteria will help us keep going strong, and you'll get a bunch of other weird, funny extra content. The link for our Patreon, as well as our social media, can be found in the show notes. So happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Merry Kwanzaa, Happy Winter Solstice, Happy Celebration of the Light Coming Back, and to all, Happy New Year. Let's make 2020 better than 2019. Thanks, as always, for listening. And until next time, I hope you have a great whatever.